Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening on a really exciting session about men's health. Um, this is such an important topic, especially for the month. We are in November, which is it's a real big focus on men's health, prostate health, cancer, and that thing, things like that. And so we really wanted to talk about this with you all. We have a couple amazing hosts this evening. We have uh, Dr. Bryce Wild, who's one of the co-founders of the DNA Company. Um, he will be guiding you through this evening alongside of Justin Harris, who is one of our clinical practitioners. And I'll give them a second to turn their cameras on and we can get this um, session started. Thank you again for joining us. Thanks so much, guys. Justin, how are you, sir? Good, buddy. How are you? Good to see you. <laughs> Not bad. You know, off air just now, the group was making fun of how young my uh, picture looked, my little icon, my placeholder picture. And I was trying to identify how long ago that was on the topic of aging. And um, let's just say uh, that maybe it was 20 years ago. And I know that biologically, I've aged a little uh, slower than average, only because I've done some testing that ultimately we'll talk about this evening, obviously. Um, but what can I say? I like to be out in the sun and the sun ages us and I don't do enough of that topical UV protection. And there's some reasons for that as well. Maybe we'll get into that uh, a little bit later on as well. L let me just start by saying uh, a, a wise old person uh, once said uh, that our genes are not our fate and aging is not a predetermined process in our cells. Dr. David Sinclair, what do you think about that? I love that. I think that your DNA is like a default setting. Like I always look at it like kind of a factory setting. And it's not to say that we can't like download new apps, right? It's not to say that we can't upgrade the software or the hardware. It's really just about what is it expressing and how can we kind of optimize that and get the best case scenario for everybody with actual gene expression. So I always say with my clients, like this is not a doom and gloom conversation like even if we're going over your red flags and the devil you know is always better than the devil you don't know so it's very valuable to know your dna yes sir i love it and you know what this is one of our this is in fact our first uh, online webinar together uh our first uh, webinar uh you know uh, uh for the dna company uh, at least and um we thought we talked off camera about this we thought we would maybe just start by introducing ourselves a little bit of backstory um and let's go my friend uh you go you let's start with you 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 are a wizard with genomics and you are one of our top clinicians but give people some insights uh, maybe some little tidbits they don't know yeah so i mean i I've, I've been fascinated with dna for quite a while this idea of having an instruction manual um and really like my health coaching practice started forever ago i worked in the supplement industry for a long time you know kind of bodybuilding and talking about nutrition and different kind of things there creatine and all that and it was it was never quite enough because it was too blanket you know it was too much like everybody should be on a pre-workout well maybe you should maybe you shouldn't and I always had in the back of my mind this thing of like personalizing and shouldn't there be some kind of diagnostic testing that we can do to see who's better off with this vitamin and who's better off with that one so it was always very fascinating to me and I spent years as a personal trainer and, you know, you'd give them an exercise program and be like, but how can I make this for them as opposed to just, well, three sets of eight and then you rest for 90 seconds and then you do it again. For some other people, maybe they're better off doing more reps or heavier weights or whatever. So, you know, in, in my journey, trying to personalize this with everybody, I got more and more into this idea of genomics and it led me to something called primal. Right. And primal is a form of health coaching that's all about hunter gatherers and kind of mimicking the lifestyle behaviors there because the homo sapien DNA requires certain things. So, you know, lifting heavy things, running really fast, avoiding poisonous things. So I started there. Then when I discovered the DNA company, I was like, "Ooh, I like that. I like that a lot because now, right, we can take what I was already doing and plug it through a filter that's going to personalize things, right? Because now I know all kinds of stuff about uh, micronutrient pathways and uh, detoxification pathways. And it's helped me to really personalize what my approach was. So now, I mean, I'm doing this full time and I, I couldn't be happier, especially talking to someone like you, Bryce. I appreciate that. That's a great backstory. And you know, I couldn't be more in sync with you. We already know this, but let's share this notion with our listeners this evening. 
uh, evolutionary biology. This is really where we get excited. Um, you know, I've been, you know, this has been my bent for now over 23 years in clinical practice. Um, I very much became um, a, a fan of the paleo, paleolithic diet and the work of Rob Wolf and Lauren Cordain uh, over a decade now ago, because it works and I mean, it appreciates our genetics. And we haven't evolved all that much over the last few hundred thousand years. So we're definitely right in, uh, in the same area of, of interest here. And um, Listen, what can I say? I've uh, taken a special interest in nutri genomics, uh, a la Dr. Jeffrey Bland back in the days where Metagenics, one of the nutraceutical companies leading, um, you know, the, the landscape at the time, uh, came in to the scene and started educating us uh, functional medicine practitioners on that notion of you can't change your DNA. You can't alter genetics. Maybe there'll come a time when CRISPR gets it right, and maybe not, and hopefully not, actually. But you can, and this is really uh, the message we're driving home uh, this evening and in most of our webinars, is that you can manage genetic expression through diet, lifestyle, supplementation, and even mind over body, mindfulness uh, concept. So uh, me in a nutshell is clinical practice with that um, focus uh, over the last 23 plus years. A lot of media, um, a lot of conventional network television, and some online stuff. And then I wear this other hat that you know about, but I'd like to share it with uh, anyone listening this evening. And that is um, doing really due diligence, doing deep dives into uh, the raw material suppliers that manufacture the ingredients that you would see uh, in consumer facing brands. You walk into a health food store and you look at a particular supplement, vitamin, mineral, nutraceutical amino acid, and you wonder what's in this stuff. I've probably been to the manufacturing plant that supplies that particular brand. Uh, so all across the world, the Asia's uh, into Japan, Indonesia, Malaysia, China, all over the place, uh, India, um, Europe, just everywhere you can imagine to do my due diligence. So what I like to describe myself as other than my clinical hat and other than what I do at the DNA company is sort of this ingredient informer, uh, if you will, uh, and then how to pair those back uh, to genetics and either up or down regulate selectively what we might see in, in our individual genes. So, uh, and that segues uh, to, into what I do for the DNA company as a co-founder. Um, uh, you know, this dates back to late 2016 um, uh, when uh, we decided that we would take personalized medicine to the next level. Um, but one of my major objectives as chief of innovations in the company is to procure, identify, um, and in put in place uh, novel ingredients that are going to be able to tweak or adjust that dial on your particular genomic uh, pathway. Um, and that's what I do. Um, we also said, so that's me, we, we also said uh, we would give uh, folks, um, a reiterate at least, uh, a bit of the DNA company vision mission led by uh, our incredible Tracy Wood, our CEO. Uh, you want to kick it off? Tracy or me? You. I don't yeah, think Tracy's with us. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, our, our mission here is to empower people, right? Like that's what we're aiming for through education, you know, so we're, we're really an education and information company. Um, it's, it's our, you know, idea that everybody should be able to afford healthcare on some level or another. It should not just be for the elites. So, you know, we're trying to bring an affordable option to actually teach people about themselves and really about what your DNA can teach you. And especially bearing in mind here that your genes react moment by moment to the stimulus you provide them. Right. So teaching people what stimulus to get the best version of their actual DNA is kind of what we're doing here. And we want to make it affordable and we want to make it not one size fits all. An actual personalized healthcare approach is kind of what we're aiming for here. Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better. We're also validating the root cause of health challenges. That's our first step towards success, the path of health and longevity. Our ideology centers around the hope and desire that all people uh, you know, uh, are, 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 have access, as you put it, to, uh, you know, for ch to change the way that they receive and experience medicine in a way that's affordable. Um, and, and this is really key, having pioneered what's literally the first functionally interpreted DNA test. So our geneticists, and, and, and kudos goes out to Dr. Mansour Mohammed, whose IP, a large part of which we, we rest on to this very day, uh, embrace the science and revolutionary understanding of our genetic blueprint. And lastly, driven by uh, the goal of achieving an affordable precision uh, medicine, as you put it, platform. Uh, we're hoping uh, to help people make their first educated steps towards optimal health 
and wellness. And of course, tonight's focus is men's health. And we can go on and on and on about this. So we're going to stay focused. This will probably turn into a series, uh, which you and I will join uh, back on into the perhaps even dozens. And largely, we want to say guided by your questions. There will be a question and answer period coming up in the next approximately 25 minutes or so uh, after Justin and I get through uh, some of the topic just to, uh, you know, set the stage. But then we'll take questions on any anything and everything. If we can't answer, we'll tell you, but we'll find out and bring it to the next episode. Um, so, you know, I thought we'd maybe start off by like, what's attracted, what, what have you noticed uh, in your world, Justin, in the last little bit, as it pertains to what's trending uh, in the world of men's health, and particularly, you know, online, even maybe beyond genetics, maybe it's genetic related. What, what do you got? So I've really been seeing more and more about peptides as well as uh, the more new version of them coming out would be like those bioregulators. And man, the, the research is insane about some of the things that they're actually uh, increasing here. Like people can take peptides and literally change their skin pigment, you know, like the melanotan ones. Um, I'm seeing, you know, peptides for recovery, the recover like Wolverine, quote unquote, um, BPC 157, I think has a ton of different, you know, application there for recovery and gut health and things. And when bioregulators come out, I mean, they're out, but when they get more mainstream, I think they're going to be a big game changer because they're all orally bioavailable. Whereas I think that, you know, the injection is a little bit, um, off-putting to a lot of people. So I've been spending a lot of time researching that. And I recently started taking uh, carbon 60 myself. And uh, I've noticed a couple of things. It's been interesting. I've been on it for probably a month to six weeks. And I've noticed my skin's been clearer. Um, I've had a little bit more energy. Um, so, you know, I think that there's something to it. I mean, just the antioxidant capacity there of carbon 60. So you know, when it comes to, you know, performance and just men's health and things, there seems to be a lot of like growth hormone agonists and different things going on out there that may allow you to build more muscle mass, get leaner, recover better, even for like injury and, and wound healing and stuff like that. So that's been kind of my, uh, my thing lately is looking into peptides and seeing kind of where they go. I think they're going to be a game changer. I love say. it. I have to agree with you. And I think that that's probably a whole other webinar, uh, which maybe will line up because I have a lot to say about that. And I'm with you. And I love that you underscore may when the science is not clear or not, let's call it conclusive. Uh, there's different grades of science. We will always admit it. We will also be excited and, and, uh, and, and provocative when the science is clear. Um, and so um, that level of confidence will vary, but we also want you, the viewer, to be doing your own due diligence and doing your own research. And then once again, come back to us with questions. You know, I think among men, uh, most uh, of us guys, we first of all have to be in serious dire issue uh, before we seek help. Um, we often rely on our significant others, typically of which are of whom are of the opposite sex. Not always, but often it is on them to take care of us and pull us in, uh, drag our tails into the doctor's office. Some kind of limb is cut off or we're bleeding from an orifice. You get what I'm saying. Yeah. DNA, it's a, one of those incredible tests that folks and, and guys can get assessed to understand where do they need to focus? What is their blueprint suggesting? What is their, you know operational manual telling them they got to get to the doctor regardless as to how they feel and make sure they stay on top of and, and a lot of us i think you know we're typically our antennas are up uh, around fitness and exercise that's the first thing you brought up and i have to agree and i think um i, I think you know it, it it's it's a topic that we're all interested in because it's often that which you know, seems to carry us through life in a way. Many men show keen interest in exercise routines, muscle building, maintaining physical fitness for all the reasons we know. Sexual health and performance is up there. Obviously, mental health, stress management will cover a lot of these things, diet, nutrition, uh, aging and longevity. But here's what I'd like to suggest seems to be, um, you know, a bit of one of those global uh, topics uh, of late that people in the guys in particular um, are focused on, and that is uh, mental health in the post pandemic world. Uh, I'm very proud of our executive function testing as it pertains to genetics uh, and some of the genes we look at to determine our resilience. How do we need to work more on that? Our stress levels, how do we manage our circadian rhythms uh, as guys get the proper sleep wake cycles, which of course impacts our aging, longevity, and sexual function, muscle mass, et cetera. 
the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, has had this incredibly profound impact on mental health. Um, there's been isolation. Uh, there's been job insecurity. Overall stress levels have gone insane. Um, so men's mental health, that's is, is often less discussed due to these like societal norms that we're all aware of. And, and it's now come to the forefront. Anyways, this is increasing recognition of the importance of addressing mental health um, and men's mental well-being as a critical component of overall health in men. And I think we just need to open that conversation more. It may be, a net, again, another podcast or webinar or two, but I think that's trending. I think guys are finally opening up to the fact that this is an organ, right? And when this is upset, the whole rest of us is upset. And for that matter, when all this is upset, this gets upset. And um, so, you know, I, I think mental health needs a lot more of a focus. I think we do an incredible job at the DNA uh, company to determine what makes us all tick up there, you know, and, and, and to understand that is empowering as all get out. And that also, you know, allows the individual, the guy to know how to even take that operational manual and what better to do with it once they understand how they think. There's so many aha moments. What do you find, I mean, with your clients when you describe to them, you know, whether they're a hamster wheel brain or they've got like the CEO executive uh, staunch approach to, to most things in life. They're good with stress. They're bad with stress. What kind of feedback do you get from guys? Man, over and over again, I get complete accuracy coming from it. It's really bizarre. It's like, you know, you spit in a tube and you send it to somebody and all of a sudden I know everything about how you process things and how you, you know, how you operate. Yeah. Um, you know, the dopamine pathway, we talk about it, you know, pleasure and reward and kind of the binding capacity there. It's always spot on. And I will say even the noradrenaline pathway, it's so accurate. If I see a deletion in there, a D or a double, a double null, we call it, they're always saying to me, yeah, man, I can't shut my narrative down. I just, I have that brain going never ending. And uh, when I did my own DNA, I, I happen to have a double null there as well. So I'm very predisposed to uh, anxiety and things. And um, now that I know that, it's like I can kind of shift a little bit of my own, you know, blame away from myself and go, all right, there's a little bit of a genetic component. Now, how do we counteract this now that we know that? And I really think that, you know, later we'll talk a little bit about testosterone and things. And I'm of the opinion that mental health, exactly what you said, can greatly impact testosterone levels because your cortisol goes through the roof if you've got negative narratives playing in the background all the time. You know what I mean? So being able to kind of keep yourself at a high frequency, your frequency is what you frequently see. Right. So if you have a viewing platform of the world and you're always looking at it like through that negative lens, it's going to have an impact because your cortisol is going to go up, your testosterone is going to go down. And next thing you know, it's libido issues and all kinds of things. So, you know, the world is not a window. It's a mirror. The way you look at things matters a ton. So knowing that via the genomic pathway can really help us to kind of pinpoint, all right, your, your dopamine is good, but your serotonin is not. Now we know where to go. Maybe it's a gut health problem, right? There's all these things that we can do from there, supplement wise and things. So it's been crazy accurate and it's really led to a lot of interesting discussions too about just mental health and kind of how to deal with the, uh, the monkey mind, so to speak. Oh my gosh. So totally true yeah. on all levels. It's, you know, not a crystal ball. We don't pretend to be, you know, uh, faith healers or draw from some, you know, divine power. We have data in front of us, which is incredibly, incredibly predictive. And in the case where, you know, it skews slightly, uh, there's a bigger story to tell because you're never looking at one gene. You're looking at a whole new, you know, numerous plethora of genes and the numerous, uh, you know, pathways involved in determining uh, somebody's mood and behavior. But I agree. I think it's so rewarding as a clinician to be able to know that. In fact, by the way, I start with the executive function. I know how I'm going to be seeing and accepting a new patient if I've got their DNA before I've even met them. And that allows for improved compliance and, you know, improved relations because that matters a lot in the healing process. Uh, before we get into the testosterone, guys, hormones, they, we all want to know more about this. Uh, we're going to get there, guys. I just you know, we're going to, we're going to have this sort of theme uh, throughout when you and I are on air, on air together uh, about answering questions. We want your questions, bring them in. Um, some of the most, you know, uh, repeated questions I get in my clinical practice as it pertains to guys' health um, is how estrogen 
impacts us. So I'm just going to cover this and we'll get into this in a lot more detail. Then I wanted to ask you uh, to share with, you know, the, the viewers and listeners what question you get most often. But I get this, well, why do I care about estrogen? Because we do this full complete panel. And again, we'll get into the details of how we look at uh, hormones in guys uh, genetically. I get, well, why do I care about estrogen? You know, listen, we've heard of the BRCA1 and 2 gene, the fatalistic genes that dictate uh, breast cancers in women. It's not exclusively to women. Guys are susceptible to some degree to these as well. And we're not looking at BRCA1 and 2 per se. We're looking at how estrogenized a male might be. There's a, a variation in expression of these genes. We're going to get into this. Um, uh, a, a, a spectrum starting with a very estrogenized type of guy throughout uh, that spectrum toward a more testosterone or androgen dominant male and everything in between, just like there is for females. So estrogen, guys, is just as important to understand how that's working in you as much as how testosterone is working in you, as much as how much testosterone you have, what you're doing to clear it, metabolize it, use it. Um, so, so we're going to get into the nitty gritty of that, but that's the one, it is so important that, you know, guys, how estrogen is working, uh, in your body and then ultimately how to even manage it. Because once again, I'll just say, and finish by saying, you can't change your genes. Those that dictate how you're working with estrogen, but you can manage their expression. That is to say, tweak the dial on how much estrogen production your body might have and shift it over in your favor. If that's in fact the case, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? I'm hearing a lot of, so, you know, guys come to me there, there's lethargy there, right? There may be libido problems there, you know, a stressful life and, and on, on and on with all these kinds of things. And, you know, a lot of them, I would say, ask me about exercise, you know, like it comes up over and over again, because that's included right in our report. It's a hormone slash exercise profile. And they might look at it and not necessarily understand kind of what it's, what it's discussing there. So, in the reports, I mean, we talk about a few different things in relation to how you recover, right? So there's the hormone pathway, and if you're dominant or balanced, but there's also like the antioxidation pathway as well, right? Because we have to understand that a lot of cardiovascular exercise can lend itself to, you know, a gumming up of the mitochondria, so to speak. So yeah, we talk about clearance with that. We talk about how to upregulate mitochondria. But one of the things that I always like to kind of plant in guys' ears when we talk about this is, you know, we need to understand that our hormones are kind of like our genes and that they react, right, to the stimulus that we give them. And it's happening moment by moment. I always try to bring things back to that kind of ancestral perspective, obviously, with my background. And I say, if you were to wake up every day and go for a run, it may be a good idea, but just understand that over and over again, you're telling your body and you're telling your hormones that all we do is lose fights, right? All we do is we run away from predators and your hormones may react to that and say, well, why would I grant this individual testosterone, which would then lead to a high sex drive if it doesn't want you procreating because you obviously live in a dangerous environment because all you do is run from predators, you know, you may be doing yourself a disservice there. Whereas if you were to now turn and lift weights, the way that that's going to break down your myofibrils and things, it's actually going to tell your hormones that this person stops and fights, right? This person fights the predator instead of running from the predator. I want this person to have a high sex drive because they're a warrior. So I'm going to, I'm going to make them look like a warrior and feel like a warrior and be strong like a warrior. So I'm not anti-cardio or anything, but guys come to me over and over again, wondering how they should exercise, why they should exercise, and I think there's a, something to be said about stimulus and response, right? And uh, so that's a lot of my conversation. I talk about compound lifting and things that really like upregulate testosterone and growth hormone because I believe it has a direct anti-aging effect on guys. Oh, there's, it's irrefutable. The literature yeah. is heavy, heavy, heavy. So why don't we start there? And you know what? Uh, don't stop. Let, let, let's just segue in for us here how, you know, we're meant to push, pull, jump, squat, lift, right? And, and, and run sometimes sprint, but not these crazy long distances, uh, perhaps uh, like the marathon style, maybe once in a while. Um, but, but what guys want to know and what, what they're wanting to hear about right now, I hear them all asking this question is, well, what is under the circumstances of my hormones, the right kinds of exercise? How do we as a company look at hormones and then determine how those hormones work for an individual 
and then up or down regulate those through diet, exercise, nutrition, uh, and nutraceuticals? Yeah. So, I mean, we, we look at a whole bunch of things and we look at this as an actual like cascade, right. Or like a cellular kind of flow. This is a steroidogenesis pathway that we're looking at, right? So this is in reference to sex hormones specifically. And, you know, the first thing that we look at, and this is in men or women, but we like to look at how much testosterone you're initially getting off of the progesterone, right? So that's how it works. Progesterone goes to testosterone. From there, testosterone can aromatize or it can androgenize, and that's going to kind of dictate how much DHT you have, which is like a really potent form of testosterone, or how much estrogen you're going to have, right? And like Dr. Wild was saying, estrogen is not evil, and we all have it. It's not that women have estrogen and men have testosterone. There's a few other things going on here. So the way that your body makes it, do you make an over-exaggerated amount of testosterone as a baseline, or do you make just enough? If you make just enough on your report, it'll say balanced, right? It means we have just enough testosterone to kind of either look like a male or female biologically, I'm saying, or if you have a dominant profile, you're going to have an over-exaggerated amount. There's a double-edged sword in there because on the one hand, hormones are very strong. They kind of like shout their signal at the body, right? So you can probably develop more muscle mass. There's, there's going to be some good in there, but it lends itself to potential inflammation based on kind of the metabolites that your body creates. So genetically, I mean, based on the CYP uh, family of genes, we're able to kind of tell how that flow goes. Are you making, you know, a lot of two hydroxy estrogen, which may be more protective? Are you making a little bit more potentially inflammatory estrogen um, and everything in between, right? We're looking at DHT, we're looking at all that. So once you have your DNA, now we know where to place our interventions, right? Is there a potential for androgen toxicity? If so, okay, maybe we'll talk about fenugreek extract, like things that might protect your prostate. Are you getting a lot of estrogen toxicity? Well, now we might talk about DIM, sulforaphane, these kinds of things. So you have to know first, and that's where the call to action is. You know, knowing your genes makes a huge difference here. Absolutely. And, and here's a visual for folks uh, that are tuning in to understand this pathway. It's exactly uh, that uh, that Justin mentioned. Uh, it, you can think of it as a waterfall or, you know, bifurcations in a creek bed, uh, river into creek, into, into ocean, if you will. I like to think of it as uh, traffic lights. And so again, whether you're male or female born into this world, uh, biologically male or biologically female, those are, you know, uh, issues of XX, XY, or some variations on that theme. But XX individuals are biological females, XY are bi biological males. And uh, whether you're either of those two types, uh, you will process progesterone into testosterone. Testosterone will then cause a uh, flow of estrogen. Testosterone also can turn into DHT or dihydrotestosterone. That's the androgenicity uh, that Justin was describing. Then your body clears that. It uh, is through a process called glucuronidization. So genes known as the UGT family, it will influence androgen receptors. But I'll, let's take a step back and go downstream now that testosterone that turns into estrogen and then what your body does to metabolize estrogen and clear that out of the body all this matters now let's build an estrogen dominant male in this instance instance you're going to have a green light that doesn't mean if you have a red light you're stopped it's just slower you're gonna have a green light going from progesterone to testosterone then you're gonna have a green light from testosterone into estrogen okay that's a now that is aggravated, if you will, or made more accentuated or, or more dominant if that testosterone into DHT is a red light. So in your mind, think progesterone to testosterone is fast, testosterone to estrogen is fast, and then my conversion into DHT is slow. This guy has a very difficult time putting on muscle mass in the gym. He's got to work two or three times as hard as the average individual, average, I say, uh, for a point, um, to make muscle mass and retain it. By the way, the, the, you know, the, the, the number one cause of frailty, the number one cause of rapid aging is sarcopenia. We'll get into this. Um, muscle loss, this trumps diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer combined. So muscle loss into old age. All right, now let's build an androgen dominant guy. You have that progesterone into testosterone. That's fast again. That's green lit. Testosterone into estrogen. That's now red. Okay, that traffic light's red or maybe amber because we use amber lights as well to represent sort of middle of the line average speed. 
So then that testosterone converts into DHT, again, green lit. That DHT doesn't clear very quickly. So let's cause the glucuronidization and the metabolism out of the body to be amber or red. Now you're holding on to the, all that DHT. All right, let's revisit the gym. This guy is bald. He's massive, lean, cut, and ripped, and he's probably only going to the gym for 45 minutes twice a week. But, and here's the big but, he'll probably be bald very early. He's a lot more susceptible to prostate issues, um, and that hyperandrogenicity causes some other problems that extend themselves into, you know, cardiovascular gut, et cetera, that we look at. So I'm being overly simplified here. Please add your two cents, Justin, or more, but the idea is that they're two opposite sides of the spectrum, that androgenized or testosterone dominant individual and that estrogenized or uh, sort of, and by the way, uh, I don't mind admitting this hormonally. My genetics suggest that I am on the side of estrogen, not fully, but estrogen dominant as a male, probably have this head of hair until late age. It is so much harder for me to put on muscle mass. I got to work at it diligently. Um, but what's your feedback about all of that? And what do you normally tell your clients if you, let's see, ha that you have an androgenized male and you have an estrogenized male? What is your guidance uh, in these two different archetypes? Yeah, so really, I mean, my goal is always to amplify the good, right, that's in there and then to kind of mitigate what might be negative about it. So if I have a, a male who happens to be androgen dominant, I'm like, all right, well, there's there's going to be some good in this. This guy's going to you know, be able to put on muscle mass like you mentioned. But what really is DHT toxicity that we need to be aware of. And it's exactly like you said, there's the glucuronidation pathways. You know, if you have a couple of copies of that, it's going to clear a little bit better, which will be optimal. But one thing that I do say is that toxins, right, there's all these localized areas that we can point to genetically. Right. Like, do you detox at the level of the liver? Do you detox at the level of the mitochondria, uh, the respiratory tract? So th there's local areas where toxins are created or taken in, but there's also like a cumulative effect. So I always say, I mean, we need to look at your, your glucuronidation and make sure that, you know, we're able to clear those toxins via maybe fasting and different things. But um, really, the better that all of your hormone pathways work, the better this is going to go. So. For example, if you have a lot of body fat, let's say, well, body fat does have a little bit of a tendency to aromatize. So if you're, let's say, estrogen dominant and you're also really overweight, we're increasing the load. So the totality of the issue is now increased. So I say, you know, if, if you're estrogen dominant and you're, you're sitting at a desk and you're eating junk food and you're not getting any sunlight, well, we know what to do now right? We need to do the things that are going to press you more towards an androgen dominant kind of a profile. So you can't change your genes, but you can change their expression, right? Via the lifestyle. So I try to kind of amplify the things that are going to increase muscle mass and burn body fat and just give you a better body composition. But I also say, you know, toxins are cumulative. So let's make sure that your liver is healthy. Let's make sure your mitochondria are healthy. Let's make sure you're not taking in a lot of dietary toxins, right? And we can kind of keep your cortisol lower, keep your insulin maybe a little bit lower, depending on the rest of your genes. So there's the local thing, and this is how we should train. This is how we should, you know, act. But I also say the whole body is one giant system that's comprised of many, many smaller systems. And let's place as many interventions in there as possible to make sure that your hormone metabolites aren't going to tip you over the edge of yeah. a heart attack or a prostate condition or whatever. So I yeah. kind of do it that way. I zoom out a little bit. Well, no, I love that you talk about, you know, post-industrial living and toxins. And that's, again, a branch off on the theme that you like to cover, which makes perfect sense is uh, evolutionary biology and how it applies uh, to genomics. And you can translate that into actionable clinical um, interventions that are easy, by the way, everybody. These are not hard. Um, these are very insightful, actionable uh, interventions that Justin's describing. And we're so influenced more than we realize by xenobiotics. And when you say aromatized, just for anyone who's not clear what you're talking 
talking about is a conversion uh, of estrogens, uh, you know, from, or, you know, for that matter, uh, upstream uh, hormones from a fat, from stored fat. It's a bit of this conundrum, catch 22, right? When you're an estrogen dominant guy, you tend to put on fat in the abdominal area a little easier than average. And then that aromatizes. And then there's, you know, it's just a bit of a vicious cycle, but these xenobiotics, these uh, dioxins and furans and PHAs and HCAs and all these things that are found in our waterways. And by the way, on that note, if you don't have a filter on your water in particular, um, and for that matter, even you know aerosolic in your uh, house, you are the filter. Um, so if you don't, this is a very important, very powerful notion. If you don't have filters around you in this day and age, you are the filter, depending on your detox genes and, and some of the uh, influence of these hormones we're talking about, guys. Um, it leads to other problems. And I say this because also part of this uh, actionable plan that we're always providing our clients uh, at the DNA company, um, we are making recommendations for lifestyle. This is not all about, you know, supplements, uh, powders and, and ingredients. Uh, this is, uh, you know, actionable exercise and, and lifestyle uh, interventions. Um, as it pertains, as I mentioned, I talk a little bit about coming back to the heart for a second. We look at certain genes. One I think is very important uh, called 9P21, looking at the inflammatory potential within the lumen of the artery lining. Uh, the nitric oxide uh, related gene, NOS3, um, vascular health. Let's just summarize it that way. Looking at vascular health, cardiovascular disease is, is, is just, should be on the top of, um, of guys' minds, females uh, as well, but very important for guys. Um, talk to your healthcare provider about, you know, getting regularly tested, which by the way, we should say this. You know, DNA is a, a one and done, if you will, test. There's ways in which we'd want you to, you know, when new science comes out and we update our DNA tests, we'd want you to redo the uh, the DNA profiling uh, for certain reasons. But otherwise, it's a very infrequently done assessment. Uh, hormones with your doctor, uh, cardi li lipid panels, inflammatory panels. I think I heard you mention C-reactive protein earlier in certain context. These are all very important to assess on an annual basis. You should be on top of what we do to look about, you know, at your hormones, guys. Uh, you should be asking your doctor for testosterone, uh, dihydrotestosterone. This is now live, as as in what's happening with my body today, regardless as to my genes, and then judge the intervention, uh, you know, using these tests. We've got a lot of these uh, uh, to offer folks as well under our various programs. Sex hormone binding globulin. This is a protein essentially that binds onto testosterone. We all vary in the amount that floats around our system. So it's not just how much testosterone are we producing, but how much is locked up? How much is not free? These are all things that we can help uh, answer for you. Um, we we're coming close to questions we've got a bunch of people raising their hands i see it um we 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 also want to talk to folks about um you know uh the the estrogen factor right like in guys we want to talk a little bit about how we can manage uh downstream estrogen uh, you mentioned uh cruciferous family extracts dim um indole 3 carbonyl how, how's that working what kind of guy do you need to see uh, to be able to then recommend these things? And then what are the outcomes you're looking at? Yeah, so within this this cascade that I talked about, we have within that CYP family of genes, it kind of determines like where the pathway goes. So with estrogen, right, there's different metabolites. And some of them are actually considered to be more protective because estrogen does have positive things as well. And some of them are considered to be more inflammatory. Right. And, you know, that term inflammation is going to be used a lot when we're talking about toxins. And, you know, you mentioned 9P21 status. It matters a lot. You know, if we're inflamed, then it's going to cause any number of health issues. So, for example, uh, there's a metabolite called 2-hydroxyestrogen, which tends to be a little bit more on the protective side. Right. And genetically, we can see how much of your estrogen is kind of converting into that 2-hydroxyestrogen. But there's also a 16 alpha hydroxyestrogen. There's also a 4 hydroxyestrogen, and they tend to be a little bit more on the inflammatory side. So if we know that you've got a dominant profile where you're making a lot of testosterone to begin with, then a lot of it may be converting into estrogen. From there, a lot of it may be converting into toxic metabolites. Well, now we need to find a way to kind of convert the more toxic metabolites back into the protective kind of 2 hydroxyestrogen. And with things like DIM, you know, I always recommend just first trying to get a number of cruciferous vegetables into the diet. 
um, like broccoli, cauliflower, right? And you can also include things like mustard seed extract to kind of get a little bit more uh, bioavailability out of it. But if there's a real problem, that may not be enough, right? Because that's only one kind of uh, component of what the actual vegetable has. So right. supplementing with DIM from there or sulforaphane or I3C, like you mentioned, um, it can help to kind of convert those more toxic metabolites back into the one that we want. So it doesn't necessarily have like a net lowering of estrogen, which in my opinion is actually a good thing because we don't want to like drastically lower it all of a sudden that can have some health consequences, but getting it into the more protective, you know, line would be a little bit better for you. Um, so I, I do recommend using some supplements if you do have that, but the, the over the counter supplements, right. Of dim, especially, I'm sure you can speak to this with, with your travels, tend to be pretty friggin' high dose in, in my opinion, because really, let's be honest, they came onto the market because there was a lot of, you know, bodybuilders that were on steroids and needed to uh, mitigate the estrogen, you know, effects thereafter. So you're talking about a 250 pound guy who's nothing but muscle trying to mitigate estrogen from an exogenous hormone that he's probably taking pretty high levels of. If you're just, you know, the average citizen trying to mitigate a bit of naturally occurring estrogen toxicity, the doses may be a little bit high. So, you know, usually they have like 100 milligrams per dose. I would recommend starting a little slower than that if you do have this kind of hormone pathway. Maybe take one every few days and get more like 25 milligrams, something like that. Um, but first things first, I would get some cruciferous vegetables in your diet. And of course, you need to know what that pathway looks like. So again, I have to recommend getting your genes done so that you know. So important. So it, let's just reiterate this whole concept here. If you're looking, which I don't necessarily recommend just blatantly or blindly supplementing with testosterone, but if you're looking to do some bioidentical hormone therapy, which in many of us guys is warranted. So whether you use and how much you use testosterone, let's bring up this estrogen dominant guy. And to your point, if he's green lit progesterone into testosterone, where does that testosterone go if DHT, the next conversion, version, SRD5A2, if that DHT gene is slow or red lit, it's flowing into estrogen, guys. You're only going to know this actually is nothing short of a qualification as to what kind of testosterone or bioidentical hormone therapy you might want to, you know, uh, attempt and also the dose and to Justin's point, what you take along with this, because often you can't eat yourself to therapeutic level. Like, and what I mean by that is you're not going to eat enough broccoli uh, for the broccofane or enough uh, cabbage or kale or mustard greens for the indole three carbonyl, which also to his point, many products out there have way too much in there. Um, but you can supplement with small amounts to shift your pathways, depending on what they are genetically to the right types of uh, estrogens on Friday, by the way, listen up Friday is all about black Friday coming up and sales that are all over the place. But this is your DNA. By the way, if you're thinking of spending on Amazon, the latest best, you know, biohacking gizmo, um, or what supplements you might want to purchase, uh, which we're coming out with a black label. Stay tuned, you know, for that into the future. This is customized at the right dose for you. Personalized supplements that we'll be um, uh, offering folks. But if you're looking into the world of biohacking and getting healthier, and you want to know what is right for you. Um, we have that play guide. We have that playbook. We've got the guide. It's your manual to understand where you should focus your time, energy, and resources. And on Friday, we switch over to 15% off um, all available testing. Uh, the ones that we uh, talked about today falls under the DNA 360 test. We've got DNA aging, which is a methylation clock. How fast are you aging? Biological versus chronological age. We've got uh, the gut 360, looking at what's going on there, inference into the microbiome in your gut. So important overall health, guys. And uh, PGX, our pharmacogenetics panel. And also remaining supplements uh, currently with this code, capital letters black friday 15 and that's available uh friday until midnight on the 30th so um just you know before you go shopping before you delve into what you should do for yourself um get tested it's the playbook justin what are your thoughts on that yeah i think that if you don't really any any recommendation that comes your way is going to be kind of a guess 
you know what I mean? So, um, and, you know, having like the methylation testing, the DNA gene and stuff, you can really get a screenshot of where you're at, you know? So we look at the genes first and foremost to know kind of what these indicators look like. But the thing that's great about being able to actually look at things with the DNA aging is that you can see where your biological age is, right? So yeah. it will kind of trigger and, and you'll know the relevance of these kinds of things. Then what's really cool is that you can go and do it again later, six months from now, and you'll see like, can you wind back the clock? Well, it turns out you can, so to speak, you know, biological versus chronological, of course, chronologically, you cannot, but biologically, you can. So yeah. being able to take that kind of screenshot is, is great. And you might as well do it when you got a deal. I mean, Black Friday is better than Christmas in, in my view, because you're never going to get a better deal than you do on Black Friday. So I would recommend definitely at the very least getting the genes done, because that way you can start to personalize your health journey. But, you know, the, the PGX is very interesting as well. Your, your doctor may be trying to put you on something that your body may not really recognize or not want genetically. And you don't, again, you don't want to become the filter for certain things, nor do you want to become your own test subject in that way either. So a little bit of uh, diagnostics can go a long way with that. You got it. All right, let's open it up to questions. A lot of folks have questions here. We're going to start with Miro. Uh, Miro, you um, go ahead. What's your question, Miro? Uh, you're on mute. If you just take off the mute button, you can go ahead and ask your question. He might have stepped away. We're going to uh, put him back on uh, uh, hold for a second. We're going to go to uh, Hengame. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, Hengame, do you have um, a question you want to ask us? And I also might be doing this wrong. I might be. Um, uh, oh, you know what? You're also on mute, Hengame. I'm not sure if you want to try clicking that unmute button there. There we go. Uh, we've got Hengame on the line with us here. Yeah, go ahead with your question. Yeah, hi. <laughs> um, my question is about microbiome. Um, I know that before the Industrial Revolution, we were, you know, not in homes and heated environment, and we lived very differently. We were designed to be part of this biodiversity. And I'm trying to figure out this whole microbiome. How do we exchange it um, with nature? Because we are nature. And yeah. I want to kind of understand more about because we do exchange our microbiome with each other as humans. And so I want to understand more with the with other microorganisms and plants. And does that happen when we're outside? Well, it's such a great question. It's a loaded one as well. There's so many you know, pre, the things that uh, predispose us to having a balanced, we'll call it diverse. It's all about real estate down there. So the more diverse uh, the microbiome is, the healthier you are, uh, the more limited in that diversity, the more it directly correlates with illness. And you're correct in your assumption and or your research uh, that suggests that you share it with the people around you. So it's not just your genetic predispositions, but also your exposures. Uh, I should say, because this helps frame it up, there's no such thing as the best microbe. And that extends itself and translates into the best probiotic. There's no such thing. There's only those microbes that ultimately are commensal that should be there, uh, that aren't there that should be there, and or that confer health benefit. So you hear a lot about strains and species and tests that are done in order to identify what's living down there. These are typically cultures or themselves genetic tests on what strains and species are live and active down there and in what ratios. Uh, so having said all that, there's no the best probiotic or the best strains and species, only those that should be there and confer health benefit and it should be diversified. Now, what we look at at the DNA company uh, are genes that dictate the health of the gut. How well, to Justin's earlier point, do you detoxify? This is the family of GST genes. Gluc uh, this is glutathionization. Uh, so GSTT1, GSTM1, GSTP1, this whole super family of genes that dictate how well you make uh, glutathione and how well you're able to process toxins out of your system. When they build up, if you will, to be oversimplified uh, and toxins ultimately crowd that environment where there should be diversity, these strains and species that are healthy, the commensal bacteria can't survive 
to that, further hormones actually dictate uh, the environment. And furthermore, and perhaps some of the most important genes are methylation genes, which you can kind of translate uh, loosely to inflammation. But at the end of the day, we look at a full cycle, not just a single gene. Most people are doing it wrong, looking at MTHFR. We look at a bunch of genes, a whole cycle, and how those uh, work either in your favor or not. And if they're not, we work to make them uh, better, um, how they will impact the environment uh, around uh, your gut microbiome. So the genes that directly impact how those good bacteria thrive in that environment is what we focus on. And if you have what we call, um, you know, suboptimal variations within these various genes, uh, then we're going to work with you to correct them, either up or down regulate their activity. And that directly translates into a healthier uh, microbiome. Does, does that answer your question? I, uh, yes and no. Um, so microbiome, you know, consists of your bacteria, fungi, and virus that is living on your skin and inside your skin. So um, you're talking more about the microbiome in the gut, right? Well, actually, um, no, this translates in, yeah, so that I'm focused on the gut. A lot of people do, you know, consider the gut first and foremost, but you're absolutely correct. We've got one in our ears, up our nose, you know, in our skin, um, vaginal microbiome, it's, it's bacteria grow everywhere. And they're very susceptible uh, to toxins and how we detoxify. They're very susceptible to inflammation and how we deal with that. Uh, they're very susceptible to the amount of hormones. So that's, you know, you, you brought up a very good point that earlier when you said, you know, we are also part of um, our surroundings and the people around us. If everyone around us is unhealthy and has a poor topical microbiome, it's actually harder for us to maintain no matter what our genes, that microbiome. But it starts end of one, starts with you and and what your genes dictate um, are a, a, a reasonable host for all these things. And keep in mind, it's not just, you know, there, there's no, again, commensal doesn't mean really good or bad in diversity. It really means, because we all have H. pylori. We all have, um, you know, some of the more dangerous um, you know, variations in uh, bacteria in our gut and, and viruses, but they're kept at bay. Um, it's when they, they're opportunistic and they grow disproportionately given our susceptibilities genetically, they come out and play and, and, and thrive. Uh, and so th those are the things that we look at, those genes that really give us insights into how these things, these microorganisms, both good or bad, because again, you could have a disproportionate amount of good. That's also not good. That's not allowing for variation. Um, so, uh, but, but please let me know if you had a more specific question, appreciating what you're saying yeah. with respect to viruses and, and other things that live on yeah. us. Yeah. From what I know, from what I, my understanding is that the ecosystem of your microbiome could consist of good and bad bacteria. So it's not so much that we're only looking at only good bacteria, it's bad Bingo. bacteria is still okay. Right. Bingo. Like I mentioned, you know, H. pylori, there could be E. coli, there could be staph. Like there's all kinds of different bacteria that are considered bad. It's really that they're bad or they, they, they extend into the realm of pathology because there's potentially pathogenic bacteria and there's pathogenic bacteria. You would know if you had them, there's conditions associated with them. But, and to your point, you have a balance and that balance remains in that, uh, you know, that, that steady state when your genes dictate in your favor. When they're not, there are ways in which you can manage uh, or improve on that balance. That's what we're talking about. So we're not looking at, you know, stool samples, uh, in the DNA company, we're looking at your genes that dictate whether or not you're uh, predisposed to maintaining optimal variation of these bacteria, both in your gut and your skin, in all of the orifices they're supposed to be, or not. Um, so, and then of course, interventions, uh, lifestyle and, and otherwise. Justin, do you have to, you have any uh, rec uh, further uh, suggestions? To yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting that you mentioned, uh, you know, the industrial revolution as well, because I would say that that kind of served as a precipitating event for a lot of things that may be disrupting our microbiome, right? Be it the skin microbiome, the mouth microbiome. Um, you know, around 10,000 years ago was when we started cultivating grains as well, because they were very easy to store and grow and things. So a lot of our diet really shifted at that point from kind of our hunter gatherer diet, where we were very immersed in the woods. I mean, we were effectively lost in nature all the way up until then, you know, before we had villages and stuff, but a lot of 
uh, you know, interacting with the environment, with the soil, things that kind of give us that alpha diversity, like Dr. Wild mentioned. Um, so, you know, now here we are in this circumstance where, you know, we've got chemicals on our face, we've got chemicals on our deodorant, on our clothes, in our house. Right. And there's a lot of like disruptors now. And I think that that's a big part of why we have a challenge. So a lot of returning to nature, right. And really trying to eat like a, a varied diet with different things to make sure you don't get, it's called a strain dominance, right? Like if you have the same thing of kombucha over and over again, cause that's the flavor you like. I'm talking about the gut microbiome, of course, but you can actually create an overabundance of that one particular strain. And, you know, to the point there of having, it's okay to have bad bacteria and good because we talk about homeostasis, right? Like right. the striving for balance within the body is kind of everywhere. So I think you're right on that, but I do think that we need to have a conversation more so about the things in modern day that are disrupting our microbiome and how we can kind of restore that natural right. health products right skin products all those kinds of things okay Correct. hope, hope yeah, that helped thank you. really appreciate yeah, it no, definitely thank you so thank much you. thank so, you so we've got a question from uh, Madi. um according to genetics what is the percentage of people who can grow uh with a keto diet versus vegetarian i love this question so there is a gene that we look at uh apoa2 you want to talk about it yeah let's do it so really you know, th this conversation about the dietary spectrum, right? I call it the homo sapien eating spectrum, right? Because there's all these camps. It's an incredibly divisive conversation, actually, funny enough. But, you know, when you look at our species, homo sapiens, we're designed to eat plants and animals. You know, you can even look at our mouth and we have a canine tooth and we also have flat teeth. And so that would suggest that we are meant to rip apart meat, but we're also meant to, you know, uh, chomp down some vegetables. But I would say that it depends on lineage and that's where knowing your genes really matters because I'm of the opinion that some people's ancestry dates back to places where there was more foliage and less animals. And some places had, I mean, you go up north, there's only animals, there's no foliage at all. And the genes is this incredible trickle down effect from like thousands of generations to where you may have landed somewhere on the dietary spectrum that's way more toward the plant-based circumstance or the exact opposite to where keto carnivore may be, you know, more appropriate. So one of the indicators that we use would be a gene called APOA2. And that gene is really, really influential of lipid metabolism, right? So a ketogenic or a carnivore diet, like a higher fat diet, especially if it's a really on purpose, high fat diet, if you have the suboptimal version of APOA2, you may still be able to handle fat like a keto diet as maybe a reset button, but I wouldn't do it over the long term because you're just not really wired in that way. And you may uh, accumulate body fat. You may actually be getting insulin spikes, right, from fat, especially saturated fat, which no one associates fat with insulin levels, but it actually can happen if your genes aren't really lined up for that. The fat bombs and the bacon with avocado and guzzling the MCTs, and it may be a bit too much for you. So I would definitely look at the APOA2 gene. I also recommend looking at your FUT2 gene as well, fecosal transferase, because that one is interesting. There, there's kind of a double-edged sword associated with it because when you have the optimal gene, for FUT2, it, it basically means that your body's going to be able to absorb B12 really well at the level of the gut, which is great. And, you know, meat is very heavy in B12, but the optimal version we found can actually also allow a little bit too much of plant toxins through, which I don't know how familiar you are with that, but lectins, right? And oxalates and phytic acid and things, it actually kind of subtracts part of your line of defense there. So I would look at the FUT2, if you also have, let's say, zero copies of GSTM1, well, now our body's not going to handle these toxins particularly well. And in my view, you should be pretty careful with getting a lot of your protein sources from uh, legumes and, and beans and things. And you may be a little bit better off on the, you know, more animal based kind of a spectrum, but it gets a little bit murky, right? If you have, let's say suboptimal APOA2, but you also have optimal FUT2, right? We need to kind of weigh all these factors against one another. I would also look at another gene called AMY1 because if you Put orchestrate a plant-based diet, yeah, you, you, we may not be that good at digesting starches either, 
right? So kind of know, do I digest starches? Do I digest fats? What's my insulin response look like, right? TCF7, L2. And then I would also look at that FUT2 to kind of figure out where on the spectrum you belong, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Dr. White, do you have anything to kind of add to that? No. So Madi, Madi was asking what the percentage, uh, you answered it beautifully. Um, but, you know, as far as I understand, the percentage of people who can grow, you know, with a keto diet, if I were to sort of inverse that and suggest how many do poorly on a keto diet, it seems as high as maybe 25% with the APO2 uh, variant Justin described would do terribly on a keto diet and in fact gain weight the wrong kind of weight from a keto diet but again it's not just about one gene we put it all together with everything that uh, justin was describing and answer the question should you be on paleo keto you know carnivore uh, vegan very few people uh, realize it but on a vegan diet if a gene like bcmo1 is uh, not the optimal variant uh, you're not converting beta carotene into retinol you need retinol at the very least if you're not gonna you know start to consume red meat ever again um typically you know you have challenges with b12 and folic acid as well and the list is long so about 25 percent do poorly pete we see you leo we see you. we're going to answer your questions um momentarily um but just to finish off with that it's about 25 percent of folks who don't do well so maybe according to genetics uh, the percentage of people who can grow with a keto diet is roughly 75 percent and then versus a vegetarian diet so many things need to be taken into consideration i was remiss because marissa asked uh first um hi what's the level uh, that's ideal for testosterone as males age i do not believe uh, that the levels listed in the reference region in australia are ideal for optimum health for males thank you no they're never optimal uh levels on uh, reference ranges um, I'm of the personal belief. We've got some charts. In fact, we'll share these in the show notes after the fact. Optimal levels, obviously, you know, this is our very point, um, will vary depending on genetics, uh, whether you're male, of course, or female, the time of day, et cetera. But um, under the uh, Canadian, Australian, you know, nanomoles per liter, it's between roughly 35 to just over 50, or if you're American, it's, you know, 100 or 1,000 rather to 1,500 nanograms per deciliter. But that's, that's a range. So optimal for testosterone, depending on free testosterone, sex hormone binding globulin, all your genes, estrogen levels, it's going to vary. Um, and most folks want it sort of toward the high normal area. Um, let's go to uh, Pete, who's uh, he's got a question, if we can get him to uh, get himself um, on here. Pete, you with us? If you take yourself off mute. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, we yeah, got hi, you. Um, yeah, I'm calling from the UK. Um, I'm age nice 60, and obviously time is not on my side. Uh, and I've recently had the uh, had your DNA test done. Um, and what I would like to say is, is from about the age of 55, because hormones and longevity is sort of right at the forefront for me now at 60, um have i got time left <laughs> um i noticed at 55 my muscles were starting to reduce from about the age of 16 to 55 i'm quite slim guy never really put on weight at all i've stayed the same weight right up to 55 um uh, but between 55 and 60 i've noticed a reduction also, I've noticed a reduction in the drive for sex, really, um, the, the sex hormone. Sure. Um, is it reversible? <laughs> that's, that's, that's well, no, question. it's a great it's a great question. And thank you so much for asking it. I'll just start by saying you are you are at midlife, sir. There's not this, you know, coming up to the end and all the, the, the this is not on your way to demise. You're at midlife. The, the science shows now very uh, uh, formidable science shows that we can easily live to 110, 120 in this day and yeah. age. And that's nothing to do with triage. I mean, that counts, but we're talking about health span, extending quality years on your life until, you know, when you get that letter from uh, the, the, well, the king now. Um, so yeah. <laughs> at, the, at the end of the day, you know, uh, uh, we, we alluded to it in the beginning. And if you're willing to open up and share some of the, you know, genes, if you have in front of you, if I'll, not, maybe yeah, I've got, I've got them in here in so, front of me. So, so there are definitely genes that are relevant to um, how easy it is to retain muscle mass. 
Um, yeah. and, and a couple of those genes that we alluded to earlier, the CYP17A1, CYP19A1, how you convert over to estrogen. Um, we talked a little bit about that as well. Um, yeah, sure. I've, I've got the CYP17A1, which is AG. Gotcha. And then 19? And the 19A1 is CT. Okay, so you're kind of uh, amber on both those lights. So, you yeah. know, that's that's a moderate pace at which you're taking progesterone into testosterone. What are you doing with the, um, you know, SRD5A2 gene? What What's going on there? Into SRD5A2, CC. Okay. Um, you want to go, Justin? Yeah, I'll go. So uh, basically, I mean, that is going to reduce the amount of DHT that you are making inherently, right? Again, we talk about these things in this context, but we can upregulate, you know, to a certain extent. So it's going to be like a, a slightly dominant profile. I mean, you are at least initially making a little bit more than others may be making. You can definitely have a worse profile for that. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's exactly what Dr. Wild said. You're halfway. You know, I would say that by no means are you cursed here. There's definitely things that you can do. And with regard to like maintaining or building more muscle mass, I mean, you know, of course, lifestyle is going to matter a ton here. And I would even say all the way down to things like your gut microbiome, right? Yeah. Like how well are you able to take, you know, protein in and actually extract the requisite amino acids to give you the serum rising of aminos needed to actually uh, create new muscle mass? Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, weight training, the taking in of amino acids, making sure that you're getting grounded, making sure that you're getting hot, getting cold, staying hydrated, breath work. Um, yeah. You know, I've had plenty of clients that have like a lot of uh, issues with libido and muscle mass and different things. And really, if you give your body enough stimulus to make it go, this dude is a warrior, like I mentioned earlier, it will actually help amplify that. Um, yeah. Are you are you lifting? Like, do you would you consider yourself a lifter? Uh, no, no, I don't actually. No, no. Um, I think when I look at my sort of mind and, and mood and behaviour sort of profile, I'm I'm pretty zen. I, I I don't feel the need to, if you know what I mean, from a, from that point of view. Um, I'm, so Pete, I'm sort of I'm Pete, I'm, com, I'm Compt AG. I'm DRT two AG. Um, I'm II II on uh, RD uh, ADR A. To be the oh, five good. HT that's... five HTT is LL and the BD NFN is GG. Yeah, well, that that's a very nice executive. I'll just Ooh. I wanted to interject and stop you right there because, as Justin was alluding to, if you are not lifting, and again, this can start with you know isometrics, you against gravity. That's how it can start, and you can add on yeah. to that. At 60, here's what you need to focus on, not losing what you have. That's going to extend yeah, your yeah. age. That's going to, that is yeah. the bottom line. What we do, uh, you know, at the DNA company, you know, to provide these insights, what, one of which is to stop muscle wasting is because sarcopenia and, and, and muscle loss, frailty is the number one cause of death. Yeah. Bar none. So, and so here's another little bit tidbit. And as it even pertains, by the way, to uh, retaining muscle mass and even the libido you discussed, um, uh, HMB, HMB or beta hydroxy beta methyl butyrate, uh, which is a long term, uh, is a, a downstream leucine metabolite, um, which essentially studies show, like a plethora of studies show, improved retention at any age, at any time, at any level of exercise, uh, retention of muscle mass. We have yeah. so many questions to get to, but I would just suggest that you get started with that. And because you've done the DNA testing already, just know at the DNA company, we have like Justin and you know his caliber and other uh, incredible um, clinicians to consult with. And that, that's an available uh, sure, service yeah. to get yeah. customized, but get lifting and, and get some. Well, of that yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying. <laughs> I mean, I do 10 minutes of just very light work and I do, and I finish it off with 50 press ups and that's, that's my lot really. But I do 10,000 steps a day, very roughly from a fitness point of view. That's amazing. Listen, centenarians, people that live beyond 100 all around the world, one of the most striking differences physiologically, phys anatomically about them is their the girth, the, the size of their quadriceps. 
their yeah. leg muscles because they have undulations yeah. within the areas they live, non-exclusive to one area. They walk up and down hills, but that's increasing yeah. muscle mass. So anything you can do to do that, anything you can do to increase muscle mass, you, you, you want to do. Um, but thanks so much for the question. We that's appreciate great. That. Thanks very Enjoy. much. Thanks, Pete. Um, we've got... Um, We've got a lot of questions that hopefully we can get to a number more. We've got uh, Marissa, we're going to come back to Leo live in a second. We've got Marissa asking, hi, what are your thoughts on ozone generators to help? I guess she's referring to um, air quality. I mean, I, I like them. They smell like lightning. <laughs> you, ever, you, ever, you ever had one in the room? You ever had an ozone um, generator in, in the area? It's antiviral, antibacterial, cleans the air, but have you done this, Justin? I've never done it, but I've definitely looked into it. And that is the exact analogy I've heard is that it's not, it smells like there's like a, a storm going on, something like yeah. that. So I'm very curious about it though, because I've heard about the efficacy of it for sure. Yeah, I think, listen, I think it works. I think certainly topical, if you can find, you know, a, a standardized topical ozone, you know, sort of trapped, if you will, in olive oil, it's got to be refrigerated or frozen. It's hard to do, but a me, I can't tell you the, the, the speed at which t like skin lesions heal, especially in diabetic patients of mine. But anyway, that aside, breathing in or having it, like if you're predisposed, which we can help you understand as it pertains to genomic panels for, to uh, infections and inflammation, it might be good to have in the background. This is a long one. Uh, Dirk asks, enlarged prostate is a common problem for men. Will passive forms of hormetic stress like red light, PEMF, molecular hydrogen, um, Brown's gas, um, uh, mitochondrial upregulation, diminished inflammation impact, reverse prostate. Do these therapies have any risk of turning enlarged prostate into prostate cancer? Are there therapies? Because there's a very long question around this. So I just want to tell Dirk, and you can emphasize this, Justin, that we look at prostate risk of both enlargement and potential towards, as it's supported by the literature, uh, toward pro we don't diagnose or tell you, here's your percentage of prostate cancer predisposition. We let you know, you know, where your hormones are trending and then give you some insightful interventions in order to down, uh, it, it decrease your potential toward this direction. And the one striking um, predictor, if you will, among others, because there's a bunch of them in our panels, is looking at how you convert testosterone into DHT, how you take that DHT and clear it effectively or not, and then ultimately downstream how your, uh, your um, uh, glutathionization is working, your general detox pathways are working. Those, all those together uh, predict a lot within the realm of um, the big C. Um, what would you add to that, if anything, Justin? I would say all those hormetic stress, um, all of those are very valuable, though. You know what I mean? So like the red light therapy, I mean, we know that it decreases inflammation it increases circulation, nitric oxide. I mean, there's a million useful things. And uh, even for the previous question there, Pete, um, you know, stuff like red light therapy can amplify testosterone as well. I mean, these things can help. So obviously we are in a circumstance where we have to use non-diagnostic language. We can't say things like cure. I wouldn't anyways for something like that, but um, yeah, hormetic stress is definitely shown to be across the board, very, very valuable for longevity. So I love PEMF. I love red light therapy. I love H2. I do hydrogen water twice a day myself. I usually do it prior to the infrared sauna as well to kind of just get the phase one and then the phase two detox. So, um, you know, I, I do think that you're, you're better off using those kind of interventions than not. But as far as the specific problem, you know, we would have to know the genes and really know the propensity there. But uh, I'm a fan of all of those therapies myself. Yeah. And anyone not familiar with hormesis, obviously, this is a little bit uh, too much will kill you. Uh, too little won't do anything. It's the Goldilocks right in the middle amount of that stressor that gets the body active, uh, you know, against that stressor, building resilience, like an elastic band, right? Creating an elastic band that's maybe a little bit cracked and old. If you pull it too tight, it'll snap and break. And if you don't pull it enough, it gets even older and crustier, like the underwear you haven't used in your closet forever. It gets that elastic just dis disintegrates. Um, but And I'm a fan of all these like you are, but I'm, a, I'm, I'm even more of a fan in the instance when somebody's got that you know, elevated DHT pathway and they don't clear it effectively for things like saw palmetto, the right type, we issue that, um, zinc, uh, coercetin, uh, these are bioflavonoids that come from, you know, onions and, and different brightly colored orange and yellow varietal fruits and vegetables into a concentrate you take, and it manages these genes. Uh, Leo, thank you so much for your patience. We appreciate it. We're going to go back and forth between uh, these uh, written questions and yours. Um, what do you got for us tonight, Leo? 
Well, thank you for taking my call, Dr. Bryce. Justin, thank you for having this meeting. It's beautiful. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. Um, I have a two-part two question. Um, <clears throat> I am taking a course on, on genomics, and um, I, have, um, I know that we're trying to help clients with um, gene expression and changing their environment and, 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 and changing their lifestyle. But I think that there's, there's a lot of things that, that come in play here uh, that affect the body, as we all know, uh, starting with, with uh, emotions. Uh, we're being bombarded every day, excuse me. We're being bombarded every day in indoor and outdoor toxins, pesticides in our food, microplastics. And, and it's really difficult to, to decipher when, when you actually are doing any kind of detox. And I apologize, it's a phone ring in the background. No it's problem. hard to determine um, when you are actually detoxing, if you're doing enough or if you're doing too much, or as soon as you step out the, uh, the door, you've already contaminated again because right. we're bombarded with EMF, with indoor and outdoor toxins, with microplastics. Um, I mean, it's overwhelming. And, well, you know, and it, it's, and it's, then, it's, it's such a brilliant question. Um, and, and here's why. Um, these are all relevant. Uh, and we could go a bit hairy, we could go a bit crazy thinking about all these things, what we're doing and how we're changing the game at the DNA company is helping an individual as you're coming to learn with the uh, coursework you're going through to hone in on what is most important. Because if it's detoxification, which is the Achilles heel of this person, we're going to want to consider more about what we do about managing those toxins in the environment, because sometimes detoxification starts with what you avoid or how you can manage exposures versus just the latest, greatest elixir or taking more glutathione. So to your point, it's absolutely imperative. If the individual's Achilles heel to continue to leverage that vernacular uh, starts with executive function and they're a worry ward and stress is their bane of existence. Well, then the intervention is lifestyle and meditation, as, as you put it, if it's, you know, the, the, the style of diet or foods that they're consuming, that's, you know, contributing to their big, or maybe it's a combination of a few of those things. The point is, we all have an instruction manual, you need to understand what that is. And then you want to focus on those areas for which are uh, your, let's call them weaknesses, so that you're not distracted. Um, because, you know, that's just going to, that's going to dilute, uh, not just the focus, but the intervention on the daily basis. It's ultimately going to decrease the, um, the aptitude or the potential for the outcome. Uh, when you're spreading, you're doing like, if everyone did every single biohack under the sun, a, you wouldn't have enough time, let alone resources to accomplish that. So we hone in on what's most important for the individual, given their predispositions. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I, I do have a two-part question to that, and that is, sure. um, uh, since this is uh, a um, webinar on men's health, uh, I missed the first part. Uh, the first part of the webinar. I'm not sure if you spoke about um, libido and low testosterone, and what can ge genomics or genetics uh, expression and changing the environment can actually improve, including infertility. Can we use genomics to improve those areas for men? Yeah. So the first part was, you know, um, Justin and I just opening it up. We're going to be doing this more often. So we look forward to everyone coming back and talking men's health. And thank you so much uh, for the second part of the question, Leo. There's so much to do as it pertains to steroidal pathway intervention and uh, libido. Um, there's also a lot to do, you know, with all aspects of, uh, one's health, vitality, uh, energy, cognitive function. I mean, every organ in the body is responding. It's got receptors on it for, uh, the sex steroids, um, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, et cetera. And guys, X, Y, we have far more for testosterone in females. They have far more for estrogen. And that's kind of the overly simplified story. But then what we do about that, depending on the genes, so let's call it, let's, let's just talk about this as a, we decide, oh, hormones don't seem to be imbalanced. The individual does seem to have it sort of together as it pertains to diet and nutrition, maybe even stress. But then we see their NOS3 gene is a relatively poor variant and therefore the sheer force the way their vasculature opens or shuts or becomes you know tightened that is the dynamic within the blood flow in the body if that's problematic well then maybe what we do is uh, try to naturally increase or offset that particular genetic expression by using arginine 
or you know modifying you know exercise uh, protocols so as to then influence uh, erectile dysfunction. I mean, it's giving you a very simple picture, um, but that's one way in which we might do it. There's a there's a real sneaky, and this is by the way going to answer Steve's question at the same time as yours. Steve asks, I'm curious to know what supplements might help increase free testosterone. Uh, I have fairly high sex hormone binding globulin or SHBG, and I've heard that Tongat Ali can help. Do you have any experience with this or other supplements? Love Tongat Ali. Um, Chris Kilm, the medicine hunter, talks about this all the time. Um, good friends with him and um, you know, the right quality Tongat Ali, horny goat weed, go figure. That's a funny name, but it's you know particularly uh, in the literature for uncoupling or managing sex hormone binding globulin. Um, you know, uh, I mentioned, um, uh, I think I mentioned earlier on, anyways, or Justin mentioned, you know, shifting metabolism of of estrogens. Uh, in your favor, sometimes using the cruciferous family can cause upstream improvements uh, in testosterone. So, so many different combinations and the right one uh, for you, uh, Leo, is going to depend on, uh, and you'll come to learn, uh, your genetic susceptibilities down the entire pathway. Zinc's an important one. Saw palmetto, by the way, as it relates to downregulating DHT conversion from testosterone to help protect the um, prostate, that can also actually help improve libido and sex drive. Go figure. So typically, herbs and nutraceutics don't have a singular action, just like a gene doesn't have one uh, sort of uh, direct outcome, right? Um, what would you say, Joss? Well, so, you know, this conversation about sex hormones, I think it's, it's very important to first and kind of zoom out a little bit and understand the mechanism, right? And then as we know your genes, I mean, we can really personalize it from there. But like, for example, with men versus women, right? Women's hormones, they operate on like a 28 to 30 day cycle, right? As we know, the, you know, the menstrual cycle, whereas men, our hormones operate on more of a 24 hour cycle, right? So um, our testosterone tends to peak about twice a day. The first one is like early in the morning, like between 6 to 9 a.m. And then the second spike happens between 4 and 7 p.m. I mean, it's not an exact science, but what I suggest as a general upregulator is to kind of time my exercise into one of those windows, right? So regardless of the gene layout, just knowing kind of how the cycle works in all of us can really help quite a bit. So if any of you haven't had your genes done yet, I mean, I suggest you do because we can get way more personal, but... Uh, for example, I mean, something that you can do just as a simple lifestyle hack or tactic is I do kettlebell swings in those hours and I'll do really hip centric kettlebell swings as well because you can kind of do them differently. But if you really get the hip thrusting motion going, that will actually give you more testosterone, right? So a general hack, let's say it's, it's seven in the morning and you're still fasted. Fasting may amplify testosterone as well. Grab a, a kettlebell and do some swings, get the blood flow. And as a general habit, that can definitely upregulate the pathway a little bit, right? So know what it's there for, right? This is a hormone that's for procreating. So just understand that if my body has toxins, it doesn't want me procreating because it doesn't want me bringing offspring into a toxic environment. So if you smoke cigarettes or anything like that, you can go ahead and assume it's downregulating your testosterone regardless of your genes, right? So keeping your detox pathways proper, um, you know, keeping your body vital with some exercise, some stretching, some breath work, uh, all of these things will improve your testosterone and you will have better circulation. Like Dr. Wild mentioned, I mean, nitric oxide is a huge factor there. That's what Viagra does, right? It, it increases nitric oxide. So things like red light therapy will do that. Things like arginine, right? You can supplement a little bit more specifically. Maybe it's not a blood flow problem. Maybe it's a hormone problem or vice versa. So kind of knowing that will help you to piece together a protocol to give you the most healthy uh, anabolic hormone pathways, if that makes sense. Yeah, thanks so much for that, Leo, that contribution. Please join us. Uh, we're going to continue the conversation here on men's health. Um, and given what you're doing, you have a lot to contribute to the conversation, uh, the fact that you're doing some um, you know, genomic continuing education. So thank you. All right, we're coming up to the end of this, um, two minutes away from the 5.30, and um, we, I'm just gonna, let's squeeze in one more 
Yeah. Um, uh, let's make it this question on D3. We didn't talk about vitamin D. We test that incredibly well. It's not just about one gene. It's a bunch of genes. Audrey's asking, why would somebody have a high serum vitamin D3? Uh, she describes at 180 nanomoles per uh, liter and is only supplementing with 1,000 IU during a Canadian winter season. A, is it da dangerous? And B, what should they do? First of all, very genetic uh, dependent. It's rare, very incredibly rare. I don't see that very often. So I, I'm curious if they're missing where else they're getting vitamin D. But you know, you could be a good assimilator of vitamin D. You could get exposed to enough uh, rare north of 40 degrees where we all live to get exposed to enough midday sun. Full body exposure of 10 minutes is going to translate to roughly 10 to 15,000 IU in the system. But in Canada, rare. Um, you're talking normally 5,000, maybe 10,000 a day. Uh, but the genes we look in, in order to get to that 180, it's not dangerous. Optimal levels are between, you know, I would say south of 80. Most reports say south of eight, um, of, uh, of, uh, of 80. I'd say south of 100 is low. Uh, and north of two, 225 is something you'd be wanting to go, whoa, I got to cut back or determine my inputs here and also maybe consider K2 uh, to avoid calcium deposition into organs and soft tissues and vasculature, et cetera. So do some further investigation. But what we look at at the DNA company is what kinds of genes dictate whether vitamin D is absorbed effectively, um, you know, essentially translated and, and, and uh, transposed, uh, essentially brought to the areas where it should be. So how your body carries and moves it around, we look at all of those genes. Theoretically, this person might be perfect across the board. I haven't seen that. Have you, Just? It's very rare that I see someone who's perfect across the board. And I, I do think that there's something to be said as well for the way that the gene layout is, because you may have really good transport such that in the serum, maybe there's a fair amount, but maybe the receptor site is suboptimal, right? And we test for all these things. So right. it's not necessarily all making its way into the cell to actually exert its influence and do what it's supposed to do. So there is different uh, vitamin D tests that you can get as well. And they're not all created equal, right? Yeah. So I would also kind of keep that in mind. Serum versus what's in the cell may be a bit of a differing uh, metric there too. Absolutely. Folks, again, take care. The, the take, uh, you know, uh, the um, uh, take advantage is the word I was looking for, the operative term of the uh, Friday sale where we switch everything to 15% off, all available testing, DNA 360, the DNA aging DNA aging that uh, Justin referred to. Gut 360, we had some questions around that. It's very important for men's health and PGX, all of it, uh, including supplements with the code Black Friday 15. And that's available Friday until uh, midnight on the 30th. Hey, man, it was so cool to hang with you for the last 90 minutes. I think we got a lot covered, and I look forward to doing more of these with you. Um, we've got some takeaways here, in my opinion, one of which is guys are showing up. I am so happy. We had some females on board here asking questions. I know on, on behalf of their, uh, their the guys in their life, but what does that make you feel? Like we've got guys actually asking questions. It's a rarity. Yeah. And it shows that there's a need and it shows that there's a market, you know, I don't think that there's a hell of a lot of actual just men's health focus. You know, I think that um, it's something that's needed out there because guys have a lot of issues, you know, I mean, modern day, we, we're dealing with toxins, we're dealing with stress, we're dealing with a lot of things. And, you know, understanding these mechanisms and understanding your genes and then having having us kind of here to help guide you through what the genes mean and how to actually interpret with lifestyle behaviors and everything. I think it's great. And I think that the number will continue to grow. So yeah, man, I had a lot of fun. This is going to be awesome. I agree. The DNA company.com for more information on this and all testing at the DNA co on social media. We will be back uh, with more about men's health, genomics, and all things that you can do uh, to intervene lifestyle, diet, nutrition, and otherwise to get you to hundred and beyond. What do you think? 110. Let's do it. Over now, brother. See you later. See you next time. Sounds good. Cheers. Cheers.